Uh, welcome to Picolite Live Coding with Jobe. I'm um, sorry for the poor frame rate with the webcam, but uh, I'm pretty sure you're not here to watch my face anyway. So, <clears throat> so about myself, uh, well, I'm kind of a... I'm not a terribly experienced uh, coder, I just started coding with Pico 8. Uh, two years ago, but I think that I managed to get onto some pretty advanced stuff uh, by now, which brings us to Pico 8 itself. Pico 8 itself is a fantasy console, which in this case means a Lua, Lua virtual machine that has uh, uh, aesthetic and technical limitations kind of like uh, kind of similar in some ways to an old school platform and i think it's one of the most approachable platforms for a newbie newbie coder interested in demo coding so i'm going to try to keep this thing this broadcast newbie friendly beginner friendly i'm going to try to keep keep it in stuff that uh, can easily be grasped if you have an understanding of, of really basic uh, programming concepts like for loops. It's, then you should be able to able to follow along. But let's let's get cracking. Okay, so first we're gonna do the basic structure of the program, which consists of f three system functions. There are function init. This thing here obviously runs, is called when the program starts. And for now, we'll just set a frame counter here, f equals zero. We could, we could use uh, Pico 8's own time function to keep time, but I prefer to, to do it this way myself. Then, we're getting to the update. Update function, and when we call up, update 60 is gonna be called. It's gonna try to call it 60 times per second. If we have an update 60 here in the program, the function, then it means it's gonna target 60 FPS. That is not the default frame rate for Pico 8, but it's it's something. It's a frame rate that I'm gonna try to try to aim at and we're gonna put a okay so every time update 60 is called it's gonna increase f by one and then we're gonna have our draw loop so this is obviously where most of the interesting stuff happens so now we should have a working program oh yeah I need to save it obviously Let's load it, and it runs. It, of, of course, it doesn't do anything yet. But we're gonna start with a very simple effect. We're gonna start with a star field. And we're starting with the star field because I'm gonna be able to show how 2D rotation works. So, first of all, let's have a, an array called star field and uh, also let's set a size for the star field in stars stars amount equals let's start with 50 and uh, then let's create our stars our initial what we're gonna see on the first first frame we're going to do a for loop of i equals 1 and it's going to go to 50 stars amount and every every time on every i loop it's going to call the function create star with and going to give it an r and d let's say 50 and uh, now, what this does, now we're going to do the create star, create star function. And our entry, 
and we're gonna enter uh, the, the variable and we're gonna call it distance so this is gonna be the distance the star has traveled and Oh yeah, we need to actually do this. Yeah, this is the add is going to add add function is going to add a new index into our star field array. So in our create star function, we're going to create an array for the star and we're going to determine the direction for which this star that it creates where it's where it's going to. We're going to call this variable theta and we're going to have a have it a random value between 0 and 1. And now we're going to get to the rotation thing. So this weird thing here is the 2D rotation matrix. Uh, it might look, uh, if you're not familiar with matrices or uh, or graphics coding, it might look a bit weird, but basically this is because uh, Pico 8 does not, uh, it doesn't have any, it doesn't have um, rotation maps built in, so we're gonna need to do it ourselves, but Fortunately, it's quite simple, so basically it's just if you want to rotate a point, then the x of the new point is going to be x times cosine theta minus y times sine of theta and the new y is going to be x times sine of theta plus y minus cosine theta. We're going to copy this here let's let's copy this here and turn it into a comment so we are gonna have it here so with this theta we can we're gonna be able to determine the direction of the star on the screen so star direction X is going to be X times uh, cosine theta so if we're going to assume that x is 1, then it's just going to be co cosine theta and minus y times sine theta, but we're going to assume that y is 0, so we're not going to need be needing it here. And direction y is going to obviously be sine theta. Okay, then star, the stars are going to need a star. Speed. So let's start with 0 0.5. It's going to be the lowest possible speed that the star can travel at, plus random 0 0.5, which is going to be the top speed over 0 0.5 that the star can travel. So, and once it once it has once it has determined these things, it's going to return star and now let's just see that I haven't done any typos or anything oh obviously I have done it okay yeah okay so where is the dumb? yeah for loops need a do obviously so yeah it still doesn't do anything but now we have a star field and now let's do a draw star function And it's going to take, get the star as the value that it receives. So now we're going to do this for, actually for star in, all right, <laughs> sorry I'm a bit nervous. Okay, so for, we're going to do a for, for loop. This means that it goes through the all, whole star field array and uh, get and treats every entry in it as one at a time as variable star. So we're gonna do draw star star, and 
Then we're gonna get here. And uh, now we're going to determine the distance the uh, the bot the distance from the screen center. So that's going to Oh yeah, I forgot one thing here, obviously star distance is equal to distance. So now screen distance is going to be some value, let's say 1.05 to the power of star dot distance. When, if we do it th this way we're gonna get sort of like an accelerating motion for it. And then we're gonna do set p set. This is the simplest graphics function in in Pico 8. So it just draws a pixel. So screen distance times star direction x screen distance times star direction y. And unless I've messed something up, we should get something on the screen now. Let's see. Yes, so this, you've noticed that uh, two things. A, it's pretty small, and B, it's all in the le top left corner. This is because, of course, zero is going, zero is in the top left corner. So, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use the camera function. This adjusts everything that the Pico 8 graphics functions do. So, this is going to move all uh, pixels 64 to the right and 64 down. The resolution of the Pico 8 screen is 128 times 128. So now it should be in the center. Yes, it's still pretty small though. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna adjust this value until we've filled out the whole screen. So let's try 1.1 and it's better. Let's see if it can be something smaller. No, 1.1 is good. So now, now it's, now it's better. And we're also going to want our stars to move. So before our loop here, we're going to do another so star. No way, we're not going to do it here, obviously. Um, Um, star distance and we're gonna add star distance and we're gonna add the star speed into it so let's see if this works and it works but obviously we're gonna run out of star pretty soon so we're gonna do another loop to find out if the stars have escaped the screen So, before this loop, we're gonna check that um, if star if if the first entry first entry in the star field if the distance is over say 80, then no wait star field I of course not star field. One, so then it's going to call the create star function, and we're gonna enter something like one as the starting distance. So let's see what we have now. We have a typo or a syntax error somewhere. Uh, stuff like okay, what did I ah? 
obviously I did it all again in the init, so... I do, I do stuff like this all the time, so I'm <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so... So yeah, now we have a star field here. It's, and now... Let's see how much, uh, how many virtual CPU cycles this thing takes now, because Pico 8 has a virtual cycle limit. Everything you do has a uh, virtual cycle cost, and if you get over 100% uh, CPU load, then it drops the frame rate. So we're gonna use a print stat 1. Stat one is the stat one is the um, function system function. Oh yeah, we're gonna reset Connor before we get there. Stat one is the system function that shows shows us how much uh, CPU power we've used, and we've used about uh, twelve percent so far. Uh, don't you have to multiply the theta in create star by uh, 2 pi? Uh, actually, no, because um, the, the, the sign functions in Pico 8 take a value between 0 and 1. So, so that's, that's the range we're aiming at. So, yeah. Um, no, where was I? Yes, and uh, now we're gonna see uh, how how huge this is gonna uh, the CPU load is gonna get once we increase the stars amount to 500. And now we notice that we are over 100% CPU load. We've dropped the 30 FPS, and we're not gonna want to drop the 30 FPS for just a simple star field. So let's get back to 50. So, this is our initial effect. We could still uh, like adjust the speed a little bit, so it will look less hectic. Yeah, and I think we're gonna be able to go to something like a hundred stars. And that looks nice, I think. So we're gonna go with this so uh, One more, yeah, I'm actually going to increase the starting distance. So, do something like 7, so it doesn't show a huge clump of stars in the center of the screen. I think it's, I think it's better now. So, now let's do something else. Let's go with a, let's go with a plasma effect, I think. And as you can see, I've prepared, I've already, uh, Pico 8 has a built-in sprite editor. And you've seen I've already drawn eight sprites. These are gonna be the tiles for our plasma effect. We're not gonna be able to. We're not gonna be able to do a full uh, plasma with a whole screen where we're gonna calculate value for every pixel because the uh, virtual cycle limit is just is just gonna get filled by that. But we're gonna do a tile plasma using this tile set of 8 sprites and let's start with creating a function for that. Let's put it here because I don't think we're touching the starfield function anymore. So we're gonna do two loops. So we're gonna start with for x equals 0 times 15. We're, we're going to have a it run this amount because all the sprites are the sprites are 8 pixels wide so we're going to be able to draw 16 of them in a on a 128 wide screen yeah and uh, then we're going to do another loop inside that from i equals 0 to 7, let's say, like that. And then we're, now we're gonna have a grid of uh, 16 times 8. And now we're gonna do a 
we're gonna have a function, or a function, I mean a variable called value, and this is gonna be the, let's say, brightness of the, of this, of the plasma in that in that space and basically it's gonna mean which of the seven sprites we're gonna draw as you can see these are numbered from zero to seven also we're going to clamp the this is not uh, necessary yet but it's gonna be necessary once we start doing count uh, functions for the plasma so we're gonna make sure that the value is between zero and seven and we're gonna make sure that it's an integer. So yeah, now it can't be like minus 3 or 15 or 5.7 or anything. And now we're going to draw our... Now we're gonna draw our sprite. So we're gonna use sprite. And uh, we're gonna use value as the number of the sprite. And... We're gonna draw it at x times 8, and we're going to, that's gonna be the x value, and we're gonna be drawing it, the upper corner of the plus matrix is gonna be at 32 pixels plus y times 8. Now, let's see what our, huh? This time I noticed that before of the syntax set syntax error and we're going to add our uh, draw plasma call here so let's see what I've messed up this time unclosed function of line 33 oh yeah we're gonna we need to close the draw plasma function as well so now we have a beautiful grid of red squares not terribly interesting but let's do something else with that. Now let's do something with our value value. Let's say we started at four. Now we're going to add something to it jump based on which frame we are in. So let's add four times sine frame counter times 0.01 so now something should happen and it's still not a plasma but it's least at least it's um, r remotely more interesting than previously so this function here let's add plus x times 0.05 so, now you'll notice that it there's this kind of pattern now, so there's a sign value based on the x value of where we're drawing. And we can do in more stuff with that, we can adjust this multiplier, let's say, judging by the cosine of y times 0.01. Let's see what's going on now. What's going on now is unclosed parenthesis. And okay, well, we're gonna have to make this larger. Okay, we're gonna have to make it smaller. Mm. And um, let's do something with this value. Okay, that's gonna, now it's looking weird. Let's just adjust this a bit more. Now it looks a bit more like a plasma. And we can still add some, can add some more operators to it. So let's add three times the cosine of y times 0.01. And it's actually it's not, not this much. Um, uh, let's make the frequency a bit higher. Let's make the frequency a bit lower. 
and let's have it scroll about a bit. So, now it looks a bit more like a plasma effect. So, we just uh, we can experiment with these values and see what we think looks pretty. So, let's just add one more thing here. And yeah, now we have a... This is something that I, I might call a plasma effect. So yeah. And now we see that we can optimize things here. There's no point really in... There's no point really in doing things uh, that are, for example, related to the x value yeah, like every time, like like seven times, without the x changing in between. So no, actually all our actually all our modifiers are dependent on. Well, let's do it this way. Let's change this to x so I can show what I mean. So now the plasma effect looks like this. And our CPU load is about 42%. But of course, it doesn't have to calculate that x value that often. So we can move it here. Plasma function 1 equals this thing, because this is not dependent on y, which is the inner loop. And let's see what that does to our CPU load. Probably not a lot, but it should decrease it a bit. Well, there's not... Well, it's... I don't think it reaches like 42% anymore, so it's... It's slightly lower. So, that's our plasma. Well, next what we're going to do... Okay, let's forget about our plasma for a while, but we're going to be returning to it later. Now, if you've seen any of my demos, you'll know that this... this function right... I mean, this effect right here is something that uh, I have a, an obsession with. So we're going to draw a twister. So, we're going to start a, our draw twister function with moving the camera down. Um, the draw, we're going to move the, where we draw things, we're going to move it down by 64 pixels. Okay, we're going to start, like, pretty simply, we're starting with a rectangle. that is from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen and from minus 32y to 32y and we want our rectangle at this point to be red. Why do we not... Oh, we do not have a rectangle because we are not calling the function. Okay. Here we have a Oh yeah, I'm going to have to remember to actually make sure that our stars are going to be white and not red. And now we have a rectangle. We have a perfectly not moving or twisting about anyway kind of rectangle. So. Let's, let's make it move somehow. So, we're going to have a face. We're going to start by doing one side of the twister. We're going to have four sides of it, and we're going to calculate the phase of rotation for that side. And it's going to be dependent on the frame counter. So, 
let's say it's 0 0.05 times frame counter and y1 which is the upper corner is going to be okay we're going to determine the size of the twister let's say it's going to be 32 pixels and uh, what the upper corner is going to be face times that the lower corner is going to be that times phase plus 0 0.25 because remember our our phase our phase is going to go from 0 to 1 so we want the next corner to be determined by the current phase uh, plus 0 0.25 so let's see what happens now we're replaced in this one y1 and this by y2 now it should be moving about a bit and we have forgotten to reset the camera also we have forgotten that this is supposed to be a sine function obviously So now it should look better. And sign is written without an E, of course. And it spins about a bit too fast, so now we have one side of the... Now we have one side of the twister right there. But we're only gonna be... only gonna want to draw it when it's actually facing the camera, so... We're only going to draw it if y1 is smaller than y2. So let's see how that looks. Yeah. So. Next thing we're going to do is do all the other sides. So we're going to do a loop from 0 to 3. And uh, we're going to want to ha have every other side of it going to, to be in a different color. So, for example, if i is 0 or i is 2, then we're going to change the color to 9. Alright. And... Our face is going to be that value plus i times 0 0.25. So, let's see what happens now. Do. But now we're going to turn this bar into an actual twister. So, we're going to do a loop from with 0 from... Z x is 0 to 127 and we're going to replace this rectangle fill function with a line function that is going to draw a line with x value x obviously and uh, it's going to be from y1 to y2 in that direction, yes. I keep mixing which is vertical and which is horizontal. English is obviously not, <laughs> not my first language, but yeah. So, now to make it somewhat twisty, let's make the x value have an effect on what the face is. So, let's see what happens now. Mm, what happens now? Well. This was, a, this was predictable, but okay. So now it looks like a weird kind of candy cane or something. So let's make this a bit, the frequency a bit lower. So 
Yeah, now it looks a bit twistier. And we can also modify this by, let's say, sign of the frequency counter time 0, 0.0. Let's go with this and see what it looks like. Now it's twisty. This is a twister. And it's a bit monocolored, but let's actually, I think we could add, wait a second, what happened to, okay. I think we could add some shading to it. Now I'm going to get to show you the fill P function, with, with which we are going to be able to do uh, patterns. So basically you can... Use fill P to set all graphics functions so that they don't fill every pixel. And we do it by setting a binary value with four with 16 digits that that uh, comprise a 4x4 four four grid. So if we could do a grid that looks like this. For example, so that's going to be a, a sort of like a, a square grid pattern and, and we're going to want to make sure that the fill P is resetted, reset after the whole twister loop. So what we have now looks like this. So yeah. And I've actually prepared uh, an ordered dither pattern here, which we can use to shade this twister. So yeah, all of these are again 4 times 4 grids. We're gonna copy this dither pattern to our init function wherever it may be. Here it is. And we're going to uh, calculate the brightness here judging by the, what, how judging by the difference of Y2 and Y1. So brightness is y2 minus y1 and because we are going to be uh, getting the value from from an array we're going to want to clamp the value between 1 and 17 uh, remember in Lua arrays array indexes start at 1 and of course we're going to want to make sure that the brightness value is an integer and we're gonna do fill p dither and we're gonna get value index brightness from the dither array. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, it looks the other way around. This is because now we normally have uh, 16 colors on screen uh, maximum simultaneously. But how the fill p works is that it draws the off bits from the um, from the uh, the low bits of the color value and the on bits from the uh, from the high bits so bits will we can uh, uh, have a value of so, well, no, sorry, I'm getting a bit confused, but uh, you, you'll see what I mean in a while. So we multiply these color values by 16. And now it looks better. And uh, we can... We can still make uh, it a bit darker by uh, removing, uh, decreasing, let's say, 7 from the brightness. And now it looks like that. And if we don't want to fade it to 
uh, completely black when it shades out. Let's see, we could say that the color aid, which is red, it could uh, uh, it could uh, fade into color two, and then uh, color nine, which is orange, it could fade into color four, which is brown. And now let's see what that looks like. So. Now we have a nice twister there. Yeah. And uh, now we've done a twister and we've done a plasma. But how about we combine the two? The Pico 8 has 32 kilobytes. Um, I think that was 32 kilobytes of addressable memory, which you can poke, uh, uh, copy however you want. And green data range is here, which I explained. This is everything that you see on screen. And the sprite sheet is here. So let's see what that means. Let's put the mem copy. Our our destination is going to be the screen memory. Our source is going to be the sprite map. And we're going to copy 8 kilobytes of data from there to the screen memory. And now, now as you see, we have just have the sprite map there. But we can do also do that the other way. So let's let's copy the center of the screen. 60, 64 lines from the center of the screen to the center of this bright map. And let's actually do that after we've drawn a plasma. We're actually going to want to do the plasma before we've drawn the stars. So, and after which we are clear the screen. And again, at the end of the loop, we're going to have it copy the sprite map to the screen. And now it looks like it shouldn't look like this. Um, Oh yeah, well, the source has to be 6800, so this means that it starts copying from line 32. So yeah, now we see, this is our whole sprite map, and we can see that our plasma effect is in our sprite map. So, what does this mean? It means that now, let's do a another version of our twister effect. Let's just wastefully copy it here. Yeah, you don't want to be repeating code, but for the purposes of this demonstration we're going to repeat code. And uh, draw twister textured. So, we no longer need the color functions. We no longer need the fill pattern because we're going to draw this in a completely different way. We're going to be using SSPR. That's the other way to draw stuff from the sprite map. And the difference between SSPR and SPR is that SPR draws one sprite from the sprite grid. It's, it's always going to be 8 times 8 but SSPR is more flexible. We can draw any rectangular area from the sprite map. So the first two values are going to be the top left corner of the area from the sprite map that we're going to be drawing. So it's going to be X and uh, 32. Then the next two are going to be the width, width of the source. So that's going to be one pixel wide 
64 pixels downwards. Now we're going to... The next two values are going to be the destination, where we draw our line. So it's going to be X and Y1. And now the size of the area... This is this is where we're gonna be able to show the scaling abilities of SSPR. So it's good. we're gonna draw the area as one pixel wide, and the height of it is going to be y2 minus y1. Now let's add our draw twister textured function here. Let's see what we've done wrong this time. We've actually done nothing wrong. It's transparent, but we can fix that with a... Because normally when you draw spy sprites, zero color, that's black, is transparent. But let's set it so that zero... We're going to use palt function. This is a built-in graphics function that adjusts the transparency of all the colors. So let's say that zero black, its transparency bit, we're gonna set it to false. And now it looks like this. It looks a bit boring because now every side is of a... every side is just the same red. So let's do this. If i equals 0 or i equals 2, so now we're going to change this palette a bit. So this is going to adjust the colors which it draws because it not these are the sprites use colors 8 and uh, 8 and uh, 2. But let's say we want the other other sides to be yellow and brown. So every other side we're gonna be changing eight into nine and nine and two into five. No wait, four was it four? Yes. And we're gonna add a palette reset function here to make sure that it resets the palette because otherwise uh, it's just gonna change this palette once on side zero and then just draw everything with that palette afterwards and because I think the pal function resets the transparency bit so we're gonna have to move this here let's see what we have now we have a missing then because why wouldn't we have a missing that? And yeah. Now now we have a textured twister. Okay, I'm I think it's looking pretty nice. It's a pretty nice effect. And now we still have time to show you one thing and that's going to be a wireframe cube. So let's start with defining our cube in the image. So we're going to be defining the vertices of the cube. So these are all going to be three-dimensional coordinates. So it's going to be an array. So the front, front face of the cube, so basically it's going to be minus 1x, minus 1y, and minus 1z. No, this is actually going to be the back face of the cube, of course. And this is one corner of the back face. Now, another corner, and another corner, and one more corner. So this, now we have a square. 
and we can just copy this line to make the other side. And because this is going to be a wireframe cube, it's not going to have a polyfillers or anything. We do not have to worry about whether our vertices are clockwise. If we would if we would fill the polygons, then that would be an issue. But right now, that we're not worrying about that. Now, let's make an let's make another another array with the lines of our cube. So let's start with our back face. It's going to be drawn. So these are all, these all have a num, obviously index number, so this is vertex 1, vertex, vertex 2, vertex 3, ver, vertex 4, and so on. So our black, the line, lines of our back face are going to be, look like this. So that means there's a line drawn from vertex 1 to 2, vertex 2 to 3, and so on. Our front face is going to be the same except starting with vertex 7. Okay. And now we're going to need to connect the faces. So we're going to draw a line from 1 to 5, 2 to 6, 3 to 7, and 4 to 8. That, uh, that there is the 12 lines. Those are going to comprise our cube. Now, to demonstrate the three-dimensional rotation math. This is a bit more complicated than the two-dimensional rotation we covered earlier, but only a bit more. So if you, if you were able to grasp the two-dimensional rotation matrix thing, you should be able to grasp this. So, let's copy this thing, which I prepared earlier, and we're going to do a draw cube function. And actually, I was, wasn't supposed to do this yet. Sorry about that, I'm getting ahead of myself, but we're gonna need this later anyway. So I've prepared two functions, which we're gonna need. A flatten point and round. Let's copy these here. So I'll explain what these do. So, flatten point is a function into which we're going to feed an x value, a y value, and a z value. And it's going to be converting them into an x value and a y value two dimensionally by multiplying them by half the, uh, half the screen resolution, dividing it by z, which is the uh, distance from the camera, and then adding 64, which is going to be mean that 0 is going to be at the middle of the screen. And uh, it's going to do the same for Y. And this is a very rudimentary way to project the 3D points into 2D space. It has no uh, field of... It, it has no FOV controls or anything, but it's, it'll do at this point. So, we're going to draw the cube. So, for cube line in all cube lines do. So x1 is going to be the x1 and y1 are going to be flatten point flatten point flatten point I'll get there eventually. Now, flatten point, and we need to send it three values, so those are going to be uh, cube vertices, cube line one, one. Okay, this is a bit uh, convoluted, but basically it means 
that we're taking from array cube vertices. We're gonna take entry the not that is the number cube from the cube line. So basically every cube uh, sorry I shouldn't touch my face. But yeah, uh, it takes the value from here. So no one and it so it that means this vertex and it takes the first value, i.e. the x value. So basically, yeah, it looks weird, but that's how it works. And we're just gonna copy this two, three times, so we're gonna get the x, y, and z value from there. And we're gonna, we're gonna copy this and get the other end like this. So now we have uh, starting starting x values and y values and ending x values and y values. And now let's see what happens when we try to draw a line between those. So first. Okay, what, what we notice that we don't so much have a cube as an X on the screen. This is because of two reasons. Uh, a, everything is centered around zero, so... And zero, the origo is where the camera is, so basically we are now inside the cube. The other thing is that our 3D routines don't really know what to do with points that are behind the camera, they confuse them. So let's add a, a trans. Let's add a translation thing here, which is going to move all our vertices. For that, we're going to move the code that defines our vertices into the draw cube function. This resets it every time. And this also means that we get to do things with them each time. So, for i equals, from i is 1 to the amount of cube vertices. And now, from each, each vertex, We're going to we're going to decrease four from the third val third value that is the z value, and now we should have the cube not on top of our camera there. So let's rotate this cube around y axis, i.e. We're gonna be using this this matrix right here, and let's define our theta value. Let's have it be something like zero times zero zero one times f. Let's have another for loop. Now. We're going to have a array called vertex that's going to be the cube vertices array index number one. Now, let's define our rotation. So let's start with x. So x rot is going to be x, so, so that means vertex brackets one times cosine theta plus vertex bracket 3 times sine theta and that's that. Y rot is just obviously going to be vertex bracket 2. We're not it doesn't change the y in any way. Z rot equals vertex 
So x knocks it. And so yeah, it means to be minus minus the vertex one times the sine of theta plus z or vertex bracket three times cosine theta. And now we're going to replace the original vertex with our rotated values. So let's see what happens now. And we have a cube that spins around the y-axis. And while we're at it, let's have it spin around some other axis, let's say z-axis. And again, we're going to wastefully just be uh, copy-pasting code. You don't want to be doing that in a real project, but this is a pretty quick way to go about things here. So, let's do the same loop, but with a different speed and with a different uh, different rotation vertex. We're gonna be using the, I mean matrix, so we're gonna be using the, we're gonna be rotating it around X. So, it's obviously gonna be X is just X. Nothing happens to that. Uh, y is Y times cosine theta minus minus z times sine theta and z is gonna be y times sine theta plus z times cosine theta let's see what happens now okay now we have a cube that spins around two axes. Let's look at it for a while. But yeah, this is uh, pretty much everything that I wanted to show tonight. Thank you for uh, thank you for watching the stream.